Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, uh, we're talking about a few things. First of all, we're talking about a guy named Travis. Off to a bad start there. A woman named Kenya Monhey, and we're gonna talk about what happened in Colorado. A lot, by the way. We keep going back there, it's, it's really in the major leagues now. In 2011, downtown Denver, a series of events led to a game of cat and mouse. Travis Forbes, a baker, being being both. He was gluten-free. I, I think that might be the only thing he was free from. Though, uh, he wasn't quite that picky before. And I doubt he is now. So, let's give it a go. It's busy downtown Denver, we're popping off to tonight. You know, I always, uh, it's like a running thing, I always gotta make fun of the places the videos are set in. Dang, I'm out. And this night, back in March 2011, well, maybe some people were out, having a few subs, doing a little dance, having a grand old time at many of the myriad downtown D nightclubs. For those kids, you know, fresh out of high school, maybe a little bit younger than they should be to be in these places. It's the time of their lives. When nightclubs are new, booze is exciting, and you don't avoid these places like the plague. One of these was the 24K Lounge in Lodo, <laughs> what the kids call it. And on the night of the 31st of March 2011, there was a gang of them out there having some fun. Girls night, and flashing a couple of fake IDs. One of them was Kenya Monhey. 19 years old, outgoing, happy, and she had just graduated Cherry Creek High School less than a year before, and she was hoping to get into TV production. Kenya was a reliable, responsible, smart young woman. She had moved to Denver from Honduras at age 12, following her mother who had moved a few years previous and married an American man. They had two kids together, and with Kenya arriving, made it a family of five. So what happened on the night of March 31st, early April 1st, was both bizarre and frightening. That night, Kenya was supposed to go out to one of the many clubs there uh, to meet up with some friends, right? But she rocked up and the bouncer took one look at her fake ID and gave it a no-no. So Kenya and a couple of other friends, they went to the 24K lounge. Kenya wasn't as close with them and she didn't have the stay together, leave together rules she had with her close gal pals. Because at one point, Kenya disappeared from the club. She left her purse, her phone, simply vanished. She had been dancing with some guy till about 1am, and then she was gone. They looked around and then left themselves. They took Kenya's purse and her phone that she left behind and assumed she just left of her own accord. The next morning, all calls, texts went nowhere. Well, I mean, her friends had her phone. Her sisters, boyfriend, friends, no one knew where she was. Kenya's parents were called and told to call the police and make a report. Her dad, well, stepdad, though they didn't really make that distinction. When her friends dropped over Kenya's stuff to the house, he went through her phone to see if there's anything. See, at 7 p.m. on April 1st, the night after Kenya was last seen, she got a text. She got many texts, but this one was different. It was weird and creepy, self-proclaimed. Hey, this is Travis, the guy who gave you a ride last night. White creepy van. Smiley face. Did you get your car home okay? No one had heard of a Travis before. Calls to this Travis character went unresponsive. Strike one. Now Travis did call back Kenya's parents the next day. And he told them his story, which went a little something like this. Yeah, so I was driving in downtown Denver that night, and I seen her on the side of the road, and she looked hammered. So I asked if she wanted a ride in my white, stereotypical rape van. She said yes. She then wanted some smokes. I drove to a gas station. She started yapping away to some guy. She left him. After that... Strike two. Clearly bullshit. Kenya's dad told this Travis to then meet them at this gas station. And he did, as did the police at this point. 
Now, Travis was very upset. He seemed very upset with himself. And he told the police the exact same story he told Kenny's parents. In fact, he seemed like a, uh, honest character. Telling a dishonest story. And so the search continued and ramped up from there. I feel like I'm gonna die without her. Two days ago, Kenya Monhe's family came forward begging for help. Miracles do happen. I've seen them happen. But now it's been almost a week since this four foot 11, 90 pound girl disappeared from this downtown Denver nightclub, leaving behind all her possessions. It's a nightmare. The police spokesman says they just met with the family, now too distraught to talk. The case is serious enough that investigators have brought in outside help the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and the FBI Safe Streets Task Force. Some of the facts of this case uh, got our attention right away, and we began uh, putting resources into it, and as we followed leads, uh, we became more concerned. Uh, Earlier this week, Kenya's stepfather told us a, quote, good Samaritan had come forward, saying he picked up Kenya near the club the night she disappeared. He told her that he lived not far from there, so he would take her home. He says the Good Samaritan claims to have dropped her off at this gas station on Spear in Pennsylvania with another man. That's the last place police say she was seen, but officers won't confirm that story or any details of the investigation. While detectives are working it 24-7, the family's clinging to hope that Kenya is still alive. Yes. She's very strong and beautiful, and she had a good heart, too. So in the search for Kenya, the police were obviously going to focus, you know, on the guy who was last seen, or Travis Forbes, he came under the microscope. 31 years old, and in those 31 years, he'd been busy with a number of interactions with the law. He had been arrested three times for burglary, twice for shoplifting, and several other times for assault, parole violations, trespassing, and disturbing the peace, all since June 1997, when he was 17 years old. But right now, it seemed like he straightened up and flew right. He was now the owner of Forbes Gluten-Free Food, formed in July 2009. Travis Eugene Forbes, of course, he named it after himself, and he ran the darn thing out of Debbie's Bakery and Cafe in Southeast Denver, renting a little space there and delivering around the city. Travis, this is Detective Gruen. How's it going? It's Travis Forbes. Hello. Oh, she put her arm through his arm like while they were while they were sitting there smoking and they spoke Spanish and they walked off and that's it that was the last that was it and I went home and that's the last you see of her? yes if she had made the choice to to go back home or to get my man I would have taken her home like I would not I mean and if I felt any sort of any sort of weirdness about her walking over that guy I wouldn't have I would have done something so then who was the guy Kenya left with? Well, Travis said this guy, his name was Dan, and that when they pulled up to the gas station, he saw Kenny, he offered her a smoke, they sat on the curb together, and they started yapping away in Espanol. Then they started walking off together. Travis asked, Kenya, are you okay? He said she ignored him, kept, off, kept on walking with this guy, and Travis said, alrighty then, my work here is done. He went and stayed with his girlfriend. He stuck to the story, and police had a goo at where he worked, Nothing odd. And his girlfriend, Carrie Humphrey, she confirmed his story. He arrived at about 3.30, left at 8 a.m. the next morning. In the meantime, no one came forward to claim to be or know this Dan the Man character they were looking for. And so on the off chance, you know, maybe Kenya had left behind some clue in Travis's van, you know, they knew that's where she last was apparently. Stuck something down the seat, something fell out, whatever. They got a search warrant to have a gander. And so, they got Travis's van, and guess what it smelled like? Not granola bars, let me tell you. It was bleached up the wazoo. They also found a lot of dirt and grass under the van, like he'd been driving, well, not in Denver City. So, what was that? Well, phone records showed he had made and received a lot of calls from Keensburg, Colorado, and that he had been there between 3 a.m. and 8 a.m not sleeping beside his girlfriend. A trip there, however, undertaken by the police was fruitless at the time. And then, something else. This must be, this must be like strike 20 for Travis, because the owner of the bakery, you know, he kind of rented out a space from, 
Well, she contacted the police with CCTV from the 3rd of April, which showed him putting a cooler in the freezer. Odd, as he didn't need to use the freezer ever. You know, freeze granola bars. And why was the cooler taped shut? He also had been burning shit in the alleyway behind the bakery. Once again, though, this was this was fruitless, and nothing related to, to Kenya was found. And then further footage came out, which seemed to reveal a little bit more of what happened to Kenya, or at least fill in some blanks. It's odd and not reassuring. This was taken from an apartment building lobby around the corner from the club Kenya had been at, and she's walking in with some guys. Then a fight seems to erupt, and Kenya's all over the place. The lads, whoever the frick, they seem to be dying to kick the shit out of each other. And this doesn't look like a safe place for her. It goes on for a bit, with one guy storming off. Kenya seems to be trying to calm things down, but then leaves alone five minutes after entering. Five minutes later, she's seen walking by another apartment building and strikes up conversation with some elf fella. She seems to be kind of standing around like she's waiting for someone, then she leaves. The way she was acting in the video looked way out of character, it looked like she had been drugged. Everything she did that night, her disappearing from the club, leaving her friends, leaving her stuff behind, it, was, it wasn't things she would do. She was known to be responsible and she wouldn't leave with a strange group of guys. She probably had been roofied, or something, in the club. Those guys were tracked down, but you know, she was seen leaving on the footage, so they may be guilty of... But Kenya left, of her own accord. Left to meet Travis. I mean, it's been two weeks, nobody's heard from her, there's been no trace of her. Like, it's... It's surreal. I don't even know what to think of it. Since you're a person of interest, let me ask you this. Did you do something with her? No. Did you kidnap her? No. Did you sexually assault her? I did not. Did you murder her? I did not. No. No. And, you know, having that on you, you know, having that energy on you is, is very stressful. Man. I'm sorry that I... that I was indifferent, that I didn't think anything... I didn't think anything. I didn't think she would. She was gonna disappear. I could have. I could have walked with them. I could have been more. I could have been like, no, you know, no, you know. I'm gonna take you home, you know, and I, you know, and, you know, been. I could have. I could have intervened more, you know, and not just said okay, and uh, and gone home, you know. Um, what's her name? Kenya. Kenya. Yeah. Did you murder her? I did not. No. Sending uh, mixed messages there, Travis. Wow. <laughs> he instantly realized he just uh, screwed the pooch on national TV. No. Not long after this, <laughs> not suspicious at all interview. What's her name? Travis disappeared. Police put out a bolo alert from. He had been, well, uh, curious, and they wanted to keep him close. And then that interview, it just blew their minds. But it seemed like he had not just left the city, he had left the state. Then, a couple of weeks later, an ex-girlfriend of Travis, she reported her car stolen to the police. And, down in Austin, a cop just happened to come across it. He checked the license, saw it was reported stolen, and saw who was driving it. Not good for Forby. Now, a hair of Kenya's had been found in his van, but, okay, he said she was in it already, right? Well, this hair found had the root attached, and it seemed like it had been ripped out. Combining this with descriptions of him as a compulsive liar, telling stories like his mother had an advanced case of breast cancer and he had to take care of her, or that he owned his own home, or how about this one? He was a dishonorably discharged Marine who had refused a second tour of duty in Afghanistan because he had killed a civilian. Uh, don't know why you would make that up, but uh, he was really just, you know, an all-round giant piece of shit. With anger issues, apparently, he would shout and roar at the others who worked in the bakery, one time beating the shit out of his own van in anger. 
So the police were, well, on the first flight to Austin. The cops were now coming down hard on old Forby, but he stuck to his story. He drove the gas station she left, end of. Wink. You know what, they send me to Texas because they think you're running to Mexico. Oh, um, the f*** do Mexico. And you- Get a it, tan? Did you do anything there? No. Sure? No. We never touched. At all? Not even a hug. I usually hug people. So hey. does she have sex with you? Nash, I think at this point, I, I, my lawyer, she probably He stopped talking, but they did get his DNA. Then, on the stolen car charge, they brought him back to a Denver jail. Where he stayed for like a day or two before this ex-girlfriend dropped the charge. And he was gone again. And then the story just... gets crazier. It was on the morning of the 5th of July 2011, after a night of partying in Fort Collins, someone called 911 to report a fire. The place, an apartment, it had been burnt to shite, and a woman had been rushed to hospital. When the firefighters arrived, a naked woman who had been severely, and I mean severely beaten, was placed in an ambulance. She had jumped from the second story of an apartment building to escape the flames. She later suffered a massive stroke in hospital due to the injuries she had sustained, and these injuries weren't from falling out a window. The only way her family recognized her was a tattoo. She was placed in a coma in order to treat her. She had been raped and beaten, and then someone had tried to burn her alive. Fuck! And she, well, obviously at this stage, couldn't tell you who. Lydia Tillman worked for a wine company, and she lived in that apartment by herself. When the investigators began to see, well, you know, who would do this to her, it wasn't off to a good start. Anything left behind was bleached, the rest, carbon. And although Lydia, she couldn't talk, and seemed like she was dying, she was able to give them a clue. She had DNA under her fingernails. The police knew Travis Forbes went to Fort Collins. Where he was from, he was staying with his grandparents there when he left Denver. So now, out of, well, curiosity, let's say, they wanted to match the DNA from Lydia Tillman to the DNA they took in Austin. Then, <laughs> get this, so they started tracking down Travis Forbes, right? Uh, it's putting him, you know, under surveillance or whatever. And Fort Collins, it's a party town, it's a college town. So one night, they followed him around undercover as he wandered around a party district of Fort Collins. And he was slugging from a bottle of whiskey. He didn't go into any bars. He was just wandering around, looking in, having a sups. Then, as the night was coming to a close, a woman, drunk, started walking home alone. Travis started following her. An undercover cop who saw this, he tried to head him off, basically went up to him, asked him a bullshit question, and he got, he asked Travis for his name at one point. Travis gave his name as Travis Kennedy. Then, Travis started doing it to another woman who was walking home alone, following her. They said, fuck this, and arrested him on the spot for giving a false name. At this point then, they were praying his DNA would come back in time. I mean, a false name, it's a bullshit charge. He'd be out in no time. And then, just as he was bonding out, the DNA results came back. He was arrested now for much more serious crimes. Attempted murder. But he still wouldn't say anything about Kenya. After stewing for some time, Travis had one request. I won't allowed to go to prison without being labeled as a sex offender. Okay. What else? That's it. That's it. You'll confess to everything if you go to prison without being labeled a sex offender. Is that what you're saying? Is yes. that your man enough yes. to that? Yes. Yes. That's what I'm saying. 
The deal was no death penalty, no sex crime charges. Sex offenders don't uh, do well in prison. They shouldn't. But the family were desperate for Kenya. So if this is what it took, then it's what it took. He'd give a full confession, and he would lead them to Kenya. I did not mean to kill her. I didn't pull over to kill her. I didn't pull over to rape her. None of that was in my head. None of it was premeditated. I wanted to bury her either next to some water or next to some trees. Why is that? Because that's where I would like to be buried. If somebody had killed me, I would hope that they would bury me next to something nice. I just dump me in some dumpster. So you find this spot. Why did you pick there? Because of the trees. Okay. And you, how long do you think you dug for? It wasn't very long. I was actually surprised. I was worried that it was so late that I wouldn't have enough time. Okay. But I dug that hole fast. Were you actually inside the hole? Yeah. And that's why you were able to tell me that it went shoulder, shoulder depth. I left. I left my credit card inside the hole. Why did you do that? It was not that I wanted to get caught. It wasn't like I was trying to brag that I did it. Because I knew that if it was ever going to be found, holy sh**, that body credit card. Those credit cards have embroidered lettering on them. I just figured it was right. I figured that if you found the body, that I should be caught. He would picked her up that night, raped and strangled her to death. He put her in a cooler, then burned her clothing. She remained in the cooler, in his van for a couple of days, then he buried her. Lydia Tillman, she was attacked as she walked home after watching fireworks with friends. Lydia Tillman would bravely make a full recovery, and honestly it was a miracle she did so after the damage that was inflicted upon her. She would go on to work as a yoga instructor. Kenya Monhi was, was finally returned to her family and put to rest. Travis Forbes got what he deserved, and he deserves a whole lot worse. But that's life behind bars, so not much of a life at all. He also got 48 years on top for his attack on Lydia. If somebody had killed me, I would hope that they would bury me next to something nice. His whole sob story was complete and utter bullshit. He was not trying to do her a favor by burying her under a tree, fuck that. When being sentenced, he did the whole, Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, me hole. He tried to do it again after he murdered Kenya. He nearly killed a second woman, and he was literally friggin' arrested while going after more vulnerable women. Though it seems like there could be more to this Travis Forbes character. A lot more. I want to confess. I want to confess so bad. Because there's more victims out there, you don't know that. That it's just a matter of time before they come up. Why are you not a man? Yes, did you know what I'm saying? Which is interesting, because in this interview, What's her name? He seems like... Well, we know, actually, he, it's not like we know he is this, uh, as someone who attacks, you know, vulnerable women. A big bit. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with me. Uh, here, go on. I'll see you as always real soon in the next old one. Until then, please take care of yourselves. I love you. Mike out.